Good afternoon, everyone. I just want to thank everyone for joining us and watching this very impactful uh, documentary commemorating the life and experiences of Silas Hunt. Um, I really want to thank our panelists for joining us and being willing to share their thoughts and ideas upon reflection of this documentary. But before we get into those reflections, I just want to give each of our panelists an opportunity to introduce themselves. So um, starting with Judge Branton, um, could you please introduce yourself for everyone? Thank you very much. I'm Wiley Branton Jr. I'm a recently retired judge after 27 years as a circuit court judge in Pulaski and Perry County, prior civil rights attorney. I'm the son of Wiley Branton Sr. And I'm actually a law school baby. I was born in Fayetteville uh, in 1951 when my dad was a student there. Thank you, Judge Branton. I'm Dr. Robinson. Uh, good afternoon. Um, thank you, Dante. Um, I'm Charles Robinson. I'm a, a, the Provost and Executive Vice Chancellor for Academic and Student Affairs. I'm also a history professor. Been here at the university since 1999. And um, I appreciate being part of this very important uh, panel and discussion about the significance of uh, Silas Sal Hunt. Thank you, Dr. Robinson. Ms. Ramona. Hello, good afternoon. Thank you, Dante. Um, I am Ramona West. I'm the Director of Diversity and Inclusion for the College of Arts and Sciences. Sciences, <laughs> that we do have scientists there. And I'm so thankful um, to be part of this panel discussion here with Judge Branton and Dr. Robinson. Thank you all for having me today. Most definitely, and just want to thank you all again um, for being willing to, to share with us um, my first question I just want to ask, and this is for you, Judge Brandon, is what do you think is the relevance, um, pretty much like the meaning of the life of Mr. Silas Hunt for us, for us today? Thank you. And if I could start off just on a personal note, I noticed that the footage of my dad that was in the video was from 1988. My dad died on December 15th, 1988. So that's some of the last video footage of my dad. And it was sort of like I visited with him uh, just now. And, and what I wanna say to the students is my, my dad was getting ready to retire and he was gonna write his memoirs. And I was gonna sit there and, and videotape him as he told his history. And I never got to do that. If, if you look at that video, my dad was full of life and nobody foresaw that he was basically gonna die at the dinner table uh, suddenly and, and end of story. So I would tell everyone listening today that the people who are important to you, you need to speak to them when you can. You, you need, don't put off conversations uh, till tomorrow because for sometimes that doesn't always come. We're in a pandemic. So it's important to have those conversations uh, with the people that are important to you. And that's one of my takeaways from this today. Turning back to Silas, let me just say that Silas Hunt was a profile in courage. I think former President Kennedy talked that wrote a book, Profiles in Courage, but Silas Hunt would have fit in that regard um, because he didn't know really what he was gonna undertake when he came to Fayetteville. And I don't think everybody really gets it today what a significant undertaking it was for Silas to come up to Fayetteville and essentially be by himself. It was still not uncommon for Black people to be lynched at that time. And even though the university may have made allowances for Silas to be the first Black person to be there, that doesn't mean that local agitators couldn't have come in and stared up trouble. We saw the violence that occurred in Central High in 57. We saw the violence that happened when James Meredith went to the University of Mississippi in 62, followed by uh, uh, George Wallace in Alabama in 63, and, you, and the story continues. So it was a significant thing for Silas to be willing to go up to Fayetteville and to be the first black person, not knowing 
what he was actually going to encounter. And the lesson that I think we can all take away from a person like Silas Hunt is that sometimes you have to be courageous about things. In our political climate today, we have put people, and I'm talking about the insurrection that we just had on January 6th, we have politicians who put their own political interests, their own self-interest, their fear of whatever, they put that ahead of our own constitution. And I think we can learn from Silas Hunt. Sometimes you have to do the difficult thing. Sometimes you have to do the right thing. And Silas was a lesson in courage. And I wish many of our political leaders could learn from that, get some backbone, honor our constitution and do the right thing. I'm done. <laughs> Yes, Judge Branson, we definitely need to be courageous during these times. And that leads us to our next question, Mrs. Ramona. Is there any hope that we will ever rid our society of all the forms of bias, prejudice, discrimination against a person or groups of people based off of race, color, sex, gender identification, physical condition, age? Is there any hope? That's a really good question, Dana, and thank you for the question. Um, I looked at this question a couple of ways. At first, I thought the, the easy answer is no. But then I thought, you know, we have hope. And I'm not naive to the fact that we all have some types of biases associated with us. And I think the first thing that we have to do is acknowledge that. And once we acknowledge it, we have to educate ourselves on it. And in particular, I think it's important when we, if, if we have biases um, in particular to those identities you just described, well, we need to then, um, after we educate ourselves, we actually need to take action about that. We need to do something about it and not just keep saying, well, that's just the way that person is. We need to evaluate our policies. We need to evaluate our practices and truly strive to make a difference so many others can thrive. So I will maintain and continue to have that hope. Thank you, Dana. You know, we really appreciate that response, Ms. Ramona. Um, it's so easy to really just feel um, desperate or feel like things will never change, but the hope Having some, some tie to hope is most definitely what keeps us pushing um, and progressing. Um, my next question is for um, Dr. Robinson. And Dr. Robinson, I want to know in what ways can um, us, like contemporary students, faculty and staff, best reflect um, their respect and allyship um, along with the legacy of Silas Hunt? I think um, Ms. West and Judge Branton hit on some really important points and, and I'm, I'm simply going to um, <clears throat> build on their points. And you know, one way that current students can demonstrate or, or support or demonstrate their, their commitment to, to what Silas Hunt's legacy was all about is to demonstrate courage. Uh, as uh, Judge Brandon has emphasized, it takes courage to be the type of person that you know that you can be in, in, in this environment, that you have to be willing to come here and to dedicate yourself to your studies, to dedicate yourself to supporting others like you who are, who are here wanting to achieve and become all that they can be, and then also the courage to look at the environment and to see what you think needs to uh, change and improve and work deliberately to accomplish uh, those goals. So courage, I think, as Judge Brandon has emphasized, is still needed today. And as Ms. West has emphasized, hope is needed because without hope, why should we bother to do anything? Why, if we can't believe that it can be done, then it undermines the doing of it altogether. It's not an empty hope, it's a hope built and based on what we know in history about how people have been able to overcome obstacles that seemed insurmountable. And Silas Hunt was one of those people. Uh, it, not only did he come here, but he endured 
while he was here and he demonstrated that he could be successful while he was here. And he really did lay the foundation for others to follow him and to follow his initial act of courage and to you know, ultimately help the university become a desegregated community that it is today. And without that first act of courage, without that hope that he could achieve his goals, then we wouldn't be here today. Yes, exactly. And Judge Branson, compared to the time of Mr. Salas Hunt, where are we today? I mean, like in terms of having in and all discrimination against people or groups of people based off of race, color, religion, sex, gender identification, nationality, um, physical condition, where are we today? <laughs> we are at a major crossroads at this time. Harry Truman was the president when I was born. And during the course of my nearly 70 years of life, if any American president had ever said they would take the word of a Russian president, in this case, Vladimir Putin, over our own intelligence agencies concerning any aspect concerning our national security, whether it was interference in our elections, whether it was bounties on our soldiers, whether it was hacking our computers, they would have been howled out of office by 90% of, of, of our politicians and our voters. That did not happen with Donald Trump over the last four years. If we had an American president who called the press the enemy of the people, and the press is a, as an important part of a, of a democracy, they would have been howled out of office by most people. But that didn't happen with Donald Trump. He got 74 million people to vote for him. And if those first things did not disqualify him from office, then I'm asking the question, why did 74 million people find him to be an appropriate presidential candidate? Was it because he was gonna build the wall to keep the folks south of the border out? Was it because he put in the Muslim ban on travel? Was it because he called out the good old boys, the proud boys, the oath keepers, the militias, told them to stand, stand back and, but stand by, that he, he would not really condemn white supremacists? Is that what they were voting for? So, and then we have the insurrection that keeps coming back to me because I can't let that slide. I can't let that slide. And, and, there, and Eve, I'm, I'm looking at a bulletin right now from Homeland Security that talks about uh, a new acronym, DVEs, domestic violence extremists. And they're talking about white supremacist groups and they see them as a continuing threat well into 2021. So we're at a major crossroads in America. And one of the things that I've, now that I'm retired and I'm starting to start rethinking some things that I've, I've, and of course, now that I'm no longer a judge, I can speak a little freer than I could before I had a muzzle on before. But you know, either you're for justice or you're against it. Uh, to me, there's very little middle ground. So, so throughout so much of my life, there have been people who have just taken no position on matters of race, discrimination, bias, or prejudice. And I'm tired of that. People need to take a position, either, either you're for justice for everyone or you're not. Either you have the ideas that promote that or you don't. Uh, so I think we're at a major crossroads. And I don't, frankly, and, and we saw, you know, you had the, the Civil War, Lincoln freed the slaves. You got the 13th, 14th, 15th amendments. And then we had reconstruction, black folks got in office. And then there was a tremendous pushback and we slip back into second class citizenship. So I don't know if that's kind of where we are today. I was feeling good about the election of Barack Obama. Never expected to see that in my lifetime. But now we got a pushback going. And if people do not stand up, if people do not take principal positions, then I'm very concerned as to where we're headed today. And it's, I'm very concerned. We're, we could be in trouble and I'm, I'm anxious to see how things go forward from here, but uh, they're, they're, we're in some troubled waters right now, and I don't know where this is going to shake out. I'm through again. 
We greatly appreciate your, your, your honest answer. Um, honest and unfiltered and, and keeping it real with us. So thank you, um, Judge Brent, for your response. Um, Ms. Ramona, I just have a, a question for you. And I just wanna know, what is your reaction to both just the documentary and what you know about the life of uh, Mr. Silas Hunt? So um, thank you for the question. I'll tell you, the first time I watched the documentary, um, I actually became teary-eyed um, to think about some of the struggles and um, the deter not only the struggles, but the determination and the courage as Dr. Um, Robinson and Judge Branton have already talked about that was needed um, to endure some of the things. Um, it was really beyond words for me. But I'll tell you that the documentary and what I saw and what I've read about Mr. Hunt, it spoke a lot about character, right? We often talk about character and how important character is. And it made me see beyond just what was on the screen and really kind of what must have been, had to been in his soul. And so I'll tell you that it was about determination, it was about courage, it was about sacrifice, but there was something I also saw in that um, video that I would, or the documentary that I would like to call out here for even us as you know, our campus community, because it took, it wasn't just him, it also took the community with him. And so I wanted to acknowledge, um, of course, uh, flowers, and Branton who were there. And then the Joyner family who was there that helped him um, for his um, daily needs and a place to stay. And also um, I'd say even Dean Leffler, those that are in position of power to actually utilize that power for good and to make things happen. And I think that that's very important. And then I also, um, in the documentary, it talked about um, the community testing the decision, right? And I think that that behooves all of us, even though we have policies and practices in place, if we don't test those things, if we don't make sure that those policies and practices are inclusive and that they do serve justice for all, then it'll be justice for none, right? And so um, I also thought about um, in the documentary, they talked about the loneliness, you know, what Mr. Hunt must have felt. And I can't imagine, and it almost emotionally unbearable to think about what he had to go through. And I understand that it takes sacrifice. And sometimes it seems like there, there's just a few, um, such as Mr. Hunt, but we need to figure out how do we come together to make sure it's not just those few and that we all have a community. And that's why I'm such a big advocate for DEI, because I want to move even beyond inclusion to a sense of belonging for everyone um, on our campus. And so um, I appreciate it, um, what Mr. Hunt did. Um, for me as a law, uh, a law student and an alumna from the University of Arkansas School of Law, I tell you, you know, we talk often about pathways. I believe he paved that road. He also put lights on the street for anyone wanting to take that drive. And um, I am forever grateful for that. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Ramona. I know uh, Mr. Salas Hunt paved a way for me to be in there today. Um, our last question, our last round of questioning, um, this one's going to go to Provost Robertson. Um, how does Silas Hunt legacy impact the University of Arkansas today? I think it has a profound impact. One is that it keeps us talking about the need to improve uh, our, uh, our, our environment uh, in areas where it serves to create greater access and success for uh, our underrepresented students, particularly. It keeps us talking about that because he laid the foundation for that conversation to be had on our campus. Uh, I think he also symbolizes grit and agency and determination. You know, these are values, these are, these are 
these are values that we want to instill in our students so that when they leave this campus, they take that with them into uh, what, you know, what we often refer to as the real world and that they are utilizing that not just to make themselves better or, or wealthier, but also they, they'll have some impact on their communities and their society. You know, I feel like, you know, he just laid the foundation for me because you know, being an administrator here at the University of Arkansas, uh, that would not have been possible. Being a faculty member here at the University of Arkansas, that would not have been possible without the sacrifice that he and others uh, made. And so I think his impact it is constant, it is continual, and, and I think it's very right that we honor him with the name of our admissions office and uh, the name of our, our very important ceremony in which we celebrate diversity, equity, and inclusion, and with any other recognition that we bestow upon him because he is that symbolically important to the evolution and the development in a positive way of the University of Arkansas. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you to our panelists, Judge Branson, Vice Provost, or I'm sorry, Provost Robertson and Mrs. Ramona. We are so honored to have this important and informative conversation with y'all. And lastly, um, Victor Wilson, the Director of Development and Priority Initiatives will do our closing remarks. Thank you. And uh, thank you to our distinguished panel. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Victor Wilson, Senior Director of Development and University Priority Initiatives. I work in the Division of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. I am a graduate of Walton College, 1985, back when it was called, simply called the College of Business. And I have two daughters who are recent graduates of the University of Arkansas. I say that because we have members of underrepresented population building legacies here on the campus of the University of Arkansas. And it is with that in mind that I say that I am honored to deliver closing remarks following the Silas Hunt documentary and the powerful and enlightening remarks of our distinguished panel. I've had the privilege of hearing members of this panel speak on other occasions, most recently Judge Branton earlier this month, and on many occasions, my friend Provost Robinson, the first African-American Provost of the University of Arkansas. Therefore, it is a pleasure to speak following their comments. I am grateful for the sacrifices of Silas Hunt and all of the others who came before us. But I'm also grateful for the community, the broader community that supported them in their efforts. They paved the way for me and other members of underrepresented and often marginalized communities to access opportunities we enjoy today. Though I am grateful I understand the mission to achieve true diversity, which is equitable in all aspects and fully inclusive of all is far from being fully realized. It is a mission that remains an uphill climb. However, it is during our darkest, most challenging, often most disappointing and difficult moments that we must realize we are standing on the shoulders of giants and trailblazing pioneers like Silas Hunt. That realization allows us to look forward and upward toward the light of a brighter tomorrow that is the fulfillment of our dreams for true diversity, equity, and inclusion for all. I thank you all for attending, for watching, and I thank the panelists and all participants and those who put this together. This is very important that we remember our history so that we may not repeat the worst of our history. 
Thank you. And I believe that concludes our program today.